War, the front is gunfire, from mortars, machine guns, automatic rifles, artillery guns. I fired my first combat shot in the war on November 6, 1942, on the southwestern front from a semi-automatic rifle SVT. It was like this. On the eve, we had a solemn meeting. Our Soviet country is 25 years old. We took an oath to fulfil the order of the motherland not a step back, and moved across the Don to the right bank. The Don was quiet, we crossed safely and almost running deep into the gully on the high right bank. Under your feet! Every now and then we heard a command, for us, mortar men, full of concrete life meaning. The mortar men are laden with carriages, barrels, slabs, just fall, stumble, and by the inertia of movement, if the movement is fast, the iron will flatten the back of your head. If it were not for heavy packs, lightly wounded mortarmen, falling would not die. A heavy pack would finish a wounded man. We took off the dead comrade's bundle and rushed on. I, as a company commissar, made sure that all documents were taken away from the dead Komsomol member, especially his Komsomol card. We jumped over some sacks or bumps until we couldn't see what. The stinking odour is depressing. Run away from it. Forward. Forward. A purple rocket hangs in the sky and illuminates the faces of the corpses. Both fascists and ours were lying here. The rockets were frequent. I sneak a look at my comrades. Do they see? Yes, they see. But everyone's faces were nonchalant. No one grunted or even swore. They said that war is war. It's the usual thing. What's familiar about it? I myself had just turned 19 and others, I knew, a little more than that, and all of them had the same experience, school shooting in the Tashkent Infantry School on an accelerated programme. I jumped over the corpses and by the edge of my consciousness I managed to marvel how quickly a man adapts to what sometimes cannot fit in his imagination. And in the same corner of my consciousness I found a place for a strange feeling in this environment, I was satisfied with myself. If anyone had looked at me as I looked at the faces of my comrades, he would have read nothing on my face but a common expression of strict concentration. To be like everyone else, that is, not worse than others, in war is a kind of confirmation of one's fullness, a big deal for self-esteem, no matter how shocked I was by the picture that opened up in the violet light of the rocket. Here they are, the insides of the war, the real environment from which they send notices, died a brave death. I, like everyone else, did what was necessary, tried not to stumble, not to straighten up at the whistle of the bullet. The last metres we run at an incline almost to the ground. The beam began to shallow, and the bullets whistle quite low, and here I jump into the trench as a serviceable soldier, alive, no chafing, no pressure, my bag and personal weapons are with me, a little breathing, and ready to shoot as soon as ordered. What took you so long? And the frontline soldiers are blown out of the trench like the wind. They are ghosts, together with their mortars, maxims, rushing past us into the gully from which we came. I don't know what kind of meeting I was expecting. Not a meeting, of course, as at the send-off from the other shore but such a lightning-fast disappearance of the former occupants of the trench prickled. I guess I expected that the old men would stay with us for a while, show us what to do here, how to fight. You're an oddball, laughs my commander of the calculation, Suvorov Pavel Georgievich. They also need to cross the Don in the dark, and have time to get far away to our rear that the Krauts did not notice. Good-natured, this laugh, Suvorov finally convinced, all from this minute as we jumped here, we, front-line soldiers. And no matter how the situation would turn out in every next minute, no one would remember or take into account that we were just understudied cadets of an infantry school. It's amazing how the instinct of self-preservation works in a man. After all, probably everyone experienced a condition similar to mine. And already we heard from the communicators, I am Zatvort. How do you hear me? Over. Battalion artillerymen were dragging boxes of shells to the guns. On the berm lined up Maxime, 
which machine gunners brought with them. In our company, mortars are also in full combat mode, and me and Fuat Hudai Bergenov. I am in Suvorov's calculation gunner and Fuat loading, attached trays with mines near his mortar. Since there is a war, it is necessary to be its serviceable unit every minute. This is the first thing. Well, the hands have done the necessary, we can look around. The trenches are stale, the sides are wiped off. So, we've been standing here for a long time. Shared an idea Makarov Nikolai, from the neighbouring calculation. All combat calculations in our company were formed from the school. Or the Germans took it from us, objected Viktor Kozlov. Both of them have calm voices, as if they had been fighting for a century. Every now and then, illuminating the bottom of the trench, German rockets fly up into the sky. The machine gun is not silent. They are afraid of our night attack, grinned Konsky Ivan, and in his eyes, for a moment gleaming in the dead light, I caught the confidence that finally calmed me down. Buteyko, our company commander, a senior lieutenant, had already sent someone to watch the observation post and warned me to be ready to replace the duty officer at dawn. Mansour, aren't you hot now? His deputy in political part, junior political officer, Kismatulin Fatkula Kismatulin, a history teacher in civilian life, asked in Tatar, who came together with Komrota and asked each of us meticulously where someone was born and what he wanted to become, for a future book, as he said. I asked him if he was hot now. He translated for Buteyko and everyone. Well, everyone is happy to laugh. The thing is that I, a Siberian by birth, had fainted a couple of times at the school shooting ranges because of the Tashkent heat. I was even afraid of being written off. We began to remember how in the school we washed our gymnasers from salt and sweat every day, and how they sprouted every two weeks. How we dreamed. I can't wait to go to the front. Here we are at the front, summarised Buteyko, looking at his watch. Now don't forget what I taught you. And the combat and experienced Komrota taught us. He was in the war from the first days. That, among other things, we, as often as possible with additional charges, cleaned the barrels of mortars from powder residue. A mine moves slowly down a clogged barrel, and the next one, sent before the previous one is fired, may explode in the barrel. Rest for now, ordered Buteyko, and he and Kismatulin ducking went further down the trench. Seryoga Lopunov immediately demanded a needle and thread from Fuat, and Viktor Kozhevnikov, a piece of paper and a pencil. I must say that in the bag of our Suvorov's loader, there was always everything that a man needed. Needles, thread, laces, buttons, scissors, razor, Vaseline, soap, shoemaker's cream, brush, iodine, bandages. Fuat was very neat, and he never sat idle. And now, while we were reminiscing, he had time to sew up the torn lining of his overcoat and was already examining the shriveled heel on Nikolai Makarov's boot. He was an excellent tailor, shoemaker, cook, and, if necessary, blacksmith and carpenter. And bread, sugar or their makorka in our platoon never divided by the method when one asks, to whom? And the other, turning away, answered, to Ivanov, Petrov, Sidorov. At our place Fuat was trusted to divide, and then everyone took any of the forty rations from the tent, confident that they were all the same. The surname Hudai Berganov means God's gift in Russian. Fuat was a Tatar by his father and an Uzbek by his mother. A strong big guy, my classmate. He didn't talk much, but when he invited the whole company to a pilaf after the victory, where did his eloquence come from? Everyone had to swear that they would come to see him in Tashkent. It was easier for me to swear than others. Shortly before the war, my father moved our family from Siberia to the Sargodon mine in Central Asia, to go home through Tashkent anyway. About all about it, and I, by the example of the majority of comrades, scribbled home a letter, wrote the address. South Kazakhstan region, Bostandik district, Kishlak Brichmula, Abdulin Gizatula, and the return address, Field Post 1034. 
I threw the triangle into the common pile, and here there were still a couple of hours left before the duty, from nothing to do, as they say. I was overcome by a thought, the name of which was fear. Ivan Konsky was sleeping and probably dreaming of his native Smolensk region, and in my visual memory the picture I saw in the gully, the purple faces of the corpses. As a coal miner, I was booked from mobilization, but I managed to get sent to the front. Four friends, Konyaev Kolya, Vanshin Ivan, Karpov Viktor and I, we appeared in Bostandik District Military Enlistment Office, proving to the military officer that we were not such experienced miners to be reserved from the front. The armour of the Defence Committee, says the military commissar. I can't and have no right. I had to, it's funny to remember, threaten that we would break into the store at night to send us even with a penalty battalion and at the trial we would testify that Major Galkin didn't want to send us to the front in a good way. Major Galkin was able to do it. He called somewhere, coordinated with someone, and here we were naked in front of a picky commission recruiting cadets to the aviation school. Accepted only two of us, my closest friend Konyaev Kolya and Viktor Karpov. Vanshin and I, again to the military enlistment office, and the same day we went, Ivan, to the Churchick Tank School, and I, to the Tashkent Infantry School, named after Lenin. Did I know that I was going towards death? I knew. My imagination did not yet present a concrete picture, seen at the bottom of the beam in the violet light of the rocket. But man is an inscrutable creature. If I find myself this minute thousands of kilometres away from this gully in my blossoming Kishlak Brishmuller on Chatkal, I will go and run to the military enlistment office again to pound my fists to be sent here. That's the thing. You don't want to die, and you can't live if you have a guilty conscience. The thought tormented me in the mine. What will I say when the war is over? That in the rear also needed personnel, especially in the mines of defence importance? They do. But you can't explain it to everyone. You can't prove it to everyone. Even those girls are taken to the front. But I don't want to die. How unbearably terrible to become a corpse in a gully, illuminated by the violet light of a rocket. Suvorov, my commander, couldn't sleep either. What is it, Mansur? He asked me. Are you chicken? It's like a kick in the butt. Come on, don't be shy, he winked. Everybody's a coward. I honestly admitted that I hadn't noticed anything like that about the guys. They don't show it, Suvorov explained good-naturedly, and again gave me a conspiratorial wink. And you don't show it. Keep your tail pistol. I wondered. Suvorov is about seven years older than me, before the war served in the cadre, in the 1st Moscow Regiment, and fought from the first days, even the Order of the Red Star he already had and I asked, is he really, and he is a coward? Do you think I don't want to live? He smiled. What can you do, Mansuchik? We didn't call them, but they came. They want their space. Ours and yours. They are superhumans, do you understand? They can only use us to clean their boots. How's that? One conversation with them, and it's a fight. A big fight. You can't just stand on the sidelines. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It was dawning. The German machine gunners were quiet, and the rockets were gone. The night was over. Come on, I'll see you off, said Suvorov. The observer's cell was well camouflaged. Suvorov looked through the periscope, moved, giving way to me, and for some time stood like that, thinking. Three hundred metres to them, he said, and the sun in their eyes. Then he wished me the best of luck and left. The sun in their eyes. So I could look for the enemy's location. I set a permanent sight on my semi-automatic rifle, put a cartridge in the barrel, rested it on the stock and tried it on. Everything is ready. It's as if the front edge of the fascists doesn't exist at all. I understand that they don't want to reveal themselves unnecessarily. That's why I don't see them. 
I watch patiently. I know that they are here, and different thoughts flicker in my head. I remembered how two weeks ago, after our division hastily loaded into echelons and took the direction to the front, our echelon was bombed on the way. Our driver braked sharply, then rushed forward. The bombs fell nearby, but from the shaving flight, German planes pierced the wagons quite aptly. Smoke of toll and coal, the smell of burning earth, the blood of the dead and wounded, groans. All this I saw, heard, breathed, when the front was still hundreds of kilometres away. Many of my comrades died without having time to kill a single Hitlerite. Could it be me too? For nothing? Will I be killed? What is this? Is that why I went to the front with such difficulties to reach my goal, to get to the front, to die without seeing my enemy? No matter how much I look at it, it's a flat steppy all the way to the horizon. No sound, no movement. And suddenly something moved ahead. My heart raced. My riffle I've shot well and in a hundred metres I can pierce a tin can. Immediately it became hot. As we get closer the target gets bigger. Germans. They're walking along the trench. How many are there? They're carrying a bundle of straw on straps over their shoulders. They turn around and you can see that there are three of them. Now they're following their trench along the front line. We've got to shoot. I decided to aim at the middle one. But what is it? I can't get the slit, the front sight and the target together. If I find the target and the fly, I lose the slit. I find the slit, I lose the fly. I'm sweating, my eyes are watering, my rifle is shaking in my hands. When I was sure that it would be a miss, I pulled the trigger. The silence was broken by the dull sound of a shot. The Germans disappeared at once and I slowly, as a mortally wounded, slid to the bottom of the cell. How I hated myself at that moment. Wuss! Missed an opportunity like that. I realised that the reason for my fear, cowardice even, in the threat of my free death for the fascists, at least kill one of them in time, to be even beforehand. From this thought, from this haste, I shook as soon as I saw them at a shooting distance. Oh, you rascal! How could anyone from the company not see his comsorg here, at the bottom of the cell, almost sobbing? All this, of course, in a matter of seconds, while sliding to the bottom, flashes through my head. With an almost indifferent face, I stand up and once again rest the butt of my rifle against the butt of my rifle. Where are my krauts? Hidden, of course. No, they are still running, bent lower and at long intervals, along their trench. Now they'll get to the place and hide. Well, now it's impossible to hit at all, I thought. The slit, the fly, the target. Strange thing, no dancing, everything in place. On a moving target with advance, I advance a couple of centimetres in front of the middle kraut and smoothly pull the trigger. The front kraut, completely bent, only a bale of hay flashes, continues to run, and the second one stopped, straightened up to his full height, his head jerked back unnaturally, and he spun around himself and dived down like a rag. The third... I simply didn't follow, mesmerised by the slow turn in place of the second. None of ours will believe I killed a Nazi. I repent, that's the first thing that went through my mind. Having just showered myself with the most profane epithets, now I am filled with exorbitant pride. I wish someone from ours had seen it, and suddenly I hear, Well done, Abdulin, well done. I think you're the commissar of your company. I look, and it's Captain Chetkasov, the battalion commissar himself. He put his binoculars down on his chest, smiling. You were the first in the battalion to open the combat account. It turns out that he heard that someone was shooting, came up and saw how I had killed a German on the second attempt. An hour later, I learned from Chetkasov that I was also the first in the regiment to open a combat account and was presented to the Medal for Bravery. To tell, frankly, then I had to do more significant deeds, and in more difficult conditions than my first destroyed Hitler, and these deeds were not marked with awards.
but everything is relative in the accounting of the war. It should be taken into account that our regiment was almost entirely formed of unshot cadets, just arrived at the front, and it was extremely important to adapt us as soon as possible in the conditions of the front line. In the company's political commissars called each soldier in honour of the anniversary of the revolution to destroy at least one Hitlerite. The commissar gave me a notebook on the first page of which he wrote with his hand. On November 6, 1942, on the southwestern front in the area of Kletskaya village, a Leninist cadet of the Tashkent Infantry School, Abdulin Mansur Gizatulovich, was the first in the regiment 1034 to open a combat account, having destroyed a Hitlerite in honour of the 25th anniversary of the Great October Revolution. Battalion Commissar Mr. Chetkasov. During the conversation it turned out that he was a Chuvash, that he had small children and a family of five at home. He told me that we keep the defence not far from Veshenskaya, the native village of Mikhail Sholokov, and to the north of us, the famous Kulikovo field. He was a good commissar. He loved the song. Everyone knows the commissar. He is neither young nor old. I was accepted into the ranks of the All-Union Communist Party and was elected party leader of the company. About all this, I wrote a second letter to my father, an old Bolshevik. Let him be proud of his son. I wrote that I had already destroyed one fascist for myself, so that I would not be offended in case of anything. It was scary on that field. In our rear, upstream of the Don, Kulikovo field, on which almost six centuries ago the glorious ancestors of the Russians were defeated by Mamai's horde. And ahead, behind the neutral strip of 300 metres, a giant horde of Hitler, which is to break us. On November 14, 1942, the regiment received a combat order to break through the Nazi defences in our area and occupy their defensive structures. In fact, the order meant battle reconnaissance, but to say that we knew about it that day is to go against the truth. A soldier is not given to know the operational plans of the command. Battalions stormed the wire barriers, anti-personnel web. To hold back the onslaught of our regiment, the Germans were forced to open fire from all kinds of firepower to discover the order of their location, which, in fact, and required our command, clarifying the details of the counter-offensive. We could not break through the enemy's defence, but we fulfilled our combat task, having lost most of our personnel and reducing our front line to actually one battalion. The picture of that first battle my consciousness was able to grasp only after its end, when in the night from November 14th to 15, among the few survivors, I went out on guard to the neutral strip. From the evening drizzled fine rain, then sharply frosted, and under our feet in the darkness thinly tinkled glass glaze. And then the full moon rose. It was like a sculptural composition of thousands of life-size figures of soldiers frozen in an icy shell, lying on their backs, hunched over, sitting, crouching, with arms outstretched, calling for the attack to continue. Icy faces with eyes wide open and mouths screaming. Piles of bodies on the barbed wire, which pressed it to the ground, preparing a passage to the Nazi trenches. Everything expresses the swiftness of the assault. The soul resisted, did not allow to accept the icy composition as reality. I believed that someone would turn on the camera now and the frame frozen for a moment would come to life. Only two months ago we passed the state exams on a shortened programme. We're about to get our junior lieutenant's cubes. Clearly to the details remembered the September evening, when all our personnel was built on the alert and the head of the school read out the order of the Defence Committee on the immediate departure of the cadet brigade in the active army. At night we greased our weapons with warehouse grease and handed them over. In the morning we loaded into echelons, and here we are rushing from Tashkent to the northwest, towards our destiny. Laughter and songs all the way. For two days the echelon went non-stop to the destination station, where the leadership of the 293rd Rifle Division, which had just arrived from the front for replenishment, was waiting for us. 
Most of my fellow cadets died in this first battle for the sake of the overall victory of our counter-offensive at Stalingrad. Did Kismatolin manage to find out from all of them what they wanted to become? He himself died in this battle, our combat political instructor. Snow began to fall. A thick veil hid the monstrous picture of the battle from our eyes. A giant blanket, white and heavy like a shroud, fell to the ground in the morning. Already in the afternoon everything was flat, white and quiet in the steppe as far as the eye could see, as if only peace and pristine purity had reigned here forever. It was quiet until November 19th. In the morning of November 19th, 1942, the frozen sides of the trenches collapsed in blocks. The ground under our feet shook like a giant layer of raw rubber. The air became suddenly dense and elastic, jumping up and down from invisible blows. One could not breathe it, one would be saved from it by the lungs and eardrums it wanted to rupture. From the side of the German trenches the ground heaved and hung motionless black screen. The rumble of guns merged into a continuous menacing rumble. So our artillery gave the signal to the long-awaited counter-offensive at Stalingrad. I want to shout, Urra ah! But instead of that from our throats comes Ereideri, the sound vibrates. And it's funny to hear this pathetic bleating from ourselves and from each other. Let's be quiet while the artillery speaks. The black screen of heaving earth is splashing over the front edge of the fascists, not lowering. That's probably enough, I thought miserably. Our artillery men are wasting unnecessary shells. We could have saved money but it's better to overdo it than to underdo it. The growing rumble of the artillery preparation suddenly stopped. At the same minute, hundreds of tanks burst out of the snow behind us and went forward through our trenches. Having passed them all over our heads, we jumped up and ran too, straight into the slowly settling wall of black dust. Here we have already passed the fascist line of defence, but we see nothing but smoking ground. Not a single living soul. No, not in vain the Leninist cadets of our regiment laid their heads here five days ago. Having learned the principle of the enemy's firepower location, the artillery today beat precisely along the entire front line, and the counter-offensive developed successfully. Not even enemy corpses are visible. We buried them all here with a powerful artillery preparation. I remember the Romanians surrendered without a fight. Antonescu caput, Stalin gut, Rus camradi gut. They play our Katyusha on their harmonica, and their horses are a sight to behold. Beautiful, well-groomed. The harness is all leather, creaking. No bars, no collars, just wide, thick straps. The wagons are roofed like gypsies. Among them very rich, rubber-tired, whole luxury cars with windows and curtains. Our rifle division turned into a cavalry division in a moment, Everyone got on horses. But after 24 hours, we had to leave the horses behind. Have you ever seen a wounded horse in the war? I did. It was a horse on which I galloped several kilometres and with which I fell down, having turned over my head three times. And here he sits with his front legs on the ground. He's shuffling them like a dancer, all wet. His muscles are shaking from the vain effort. He doesn't realise yet that he can't get up. His nostrils are swollen with funnels and pink with blood. He moans like a man and looks at me with wide open eyes from which tears roll. And I'm standing there and I can't find the strength to shoot him. One of the elderly soldiers stopped and stopped the agony of the wounded horse, put a carbine in his ear and shot him. I am writing these lines and crying. From the feeling of our guilt before everything living and so harmonious in nature, what was the wounded, seriously dying horse thinking, looking into my eyes with wide open eyes? That humans are an unnatural, nature-damaging force? No, only that force itself can understand. In that fatal moment, the horse was waiting for salvation and help from me, a human being. At first, our artillerymen decided to change their Mongols for Romanian heavyweight bitooks, but after a day, they were harnessed and it was good that the Mongols, which had been rejected, did not take offence at their sledders and ran like faithful dogs beside them. 
small in stature and shaggy, angry and biting, Mongolian humpback horses turned out to be very hardy and served us well throughout the war, and we had to leave the Romanian horses one by one in a clear field. Though well-fed and beautiful, they turned out to be too tender for the war. Our tankers stormed Calahondon alone. We, the infantry, entered the city liberated by them a day later. Just before almost Calah, stretching heavily along the highway, who was still on horseback and who on foot, we suddenly heard, air. Where could the aviation come from? The day is foggy, but I hear the noise of engines. And then I saw, at a height it seems, no more than a hundred metres, there were German bomb carriers flying. They are flying along the road, in the course of our movement, and dropping bombs. Falling in a dense scattering, one could be killed by an overweight chump, and hitting the ground, these bombs did not explode at once. In the time they were tumbling and sliding on the slippery snow before they exploded, there was a lot to think and do. Comparatively much. For some seconds I, together with everyone else, continued to run away from the falling bombs as we moved, jumping over those who, obeying the command, air, fell down. Where I go around, and where I jump over chunks with deadly stuffing, which had just fallen in front of me, there were already a dozen of them in my field of vision, and behind there were already explosions, followed by a continuous rumble and the ground from above. Before I realise that I have to change course sharply, by ninety degrees, away from the road, I turn. But even on this coursey, a hugey fool is tumbling into the ditch ahead of me. I can't go around it, because I'm flying like a bullet. How long has she been down? I ask myself, will I make it? I've already flown above her, and I'm angry that I'm flying slowly, as if she's holding me above her with a magnet. But now I'm running again, and my back feels as if it senses. You can run for another half a minute, but then fall and stick into the ground. Something flew over me and crashed in front of me. I'm jumping over. What am I jumping over? A horse's head? A bridle? I recognise it. Our platoon leader's horse. I fall at last. I'm in trouble. I turn into a flexible sheet, like a flounder. My bag was blown off my back by an explosion and carried away somewhere. Stunned, I get up and cough and vomit, turning me inside out. Black earth, snow as if there was no snow bloody shreds of someone's hands and feet, the smell of burning earth, a piercing pain in my ears, and in my head the picture that my vision managed to capture in a minute of a wild run. A hollow chink crashed into the horse's back and knocked him down together with our platoon commander, who just wanted to jump off him, one leg on the ground and the other still in the stirrup. The road, a bloody mess of those who immediately fell down at the command air, the bridge over the Don, on which our tankers broke through to Kalach, was already destroyed by fascist aviation, and the ice was still thin and so slippery, smooth as glass, that it was impossible to step on it. With heavy barrels, carriages, plates, we will break it in no time, and all of us will find ourselves in icy water. Only one should slip and fall. The command to gather sand in helmets and overcoats and pour it in front of us, spreading out five metres from each other. And now, chain by chain, we cautiously walk on thin, sparkling ice. The ice is sagging under our feet. It's about to burst. During the whole war, I can't remember a quieter crossing than this one. For dozens of metres in both directions, I can hear only grunting and muffled grumbling. Quiet! Don't stomp like an elephant! Be careful! There's a bridge to the side of us. It's covered with sappers like ants. In front of the bridge there is a pandemonium of cars mixed with horse-drawn carts, and more and more are coming without end. Artillery men cannot force the river on such shaky ice, and are also waiting for the sappers to build a destroyed span. And we, the infantry, are already on the left bank. Where are our tankers? All along the way from the Don to the city, in trenches, ditches, on the road, the corpses of fascists and enemy equipment. Our tankers gave the Hitlerites a good light. We enter Kalach at dawn. On deserted streets there are traces of panic retreat of the enemy. Looted and abandoned in the middle of the streets, junk is lying. Windows in houses are open, 
heaps of broken glass. Apparently, Hitlerites jumped into the street right out of the windows. There hung down from the windowsill a dead German in a long shirt. Where are the Germans? In eight kilometres from us. A large village, Ilarionovka. Battalion commander Dudko Ignat Sevostyanovich and Commissar Chetkasov, Alexander Ilyich, called me and Mayorov, a cadet from Orsk Aerial Photography School. Four hours to get to Ilarionovka. Scout whether occupied by the Germans, return and report. Majorov was two or three years older than me, physically strong, of medium height, but stocky. He was appointed senior. To save time, he and I decided to ride our bicycles as far as we could. The time was 20 hours. We rode fast on the road, trampled by retreating Germans, just pedal. Here we passed our combat patrol and dived into the alarming darkness but about halfway down the road suddenly bifurcated and we dismounted. I don't know how Majorov, but in my Tashkent infantry school, I had time to familiarise myself with the combat tactics of night reconnaissance. And when Majorov decided to go our own way and act independently, I objected that it was dangerous if the village was occupied and the Germans had posted sentries. Surely both roads on both sides lead to Ilarionovka, it is better to follow each other at a distance of minimum visibility so that one could cover the other. But Majorov did not enter into a discussion of further actions. Chickened out, he asked with superiority, and I was forced to obey. Yes, both because the accusation of cowardice seemed offensive and because the order of a superior is not discussed. Meet at this fork, ordered Mayorov. If my bicycle will still be here, wait for me 15 or 20 minutes, no more. And he left on one road, and I had nothing left but to go on the other. The situation in an instant became extremely unfavourable, pointless even. If Ilarionovka is occupied by the Germans, then on the approaches to it there are necessarily posted battle guards and sentries. These sentries are hidden, camouflaged, in other words, ambushes and I am stomping in their direction at full height, not covered by anyone, not insured by anyone. Not a scout, but a living tongue, to take which is not difficult. In an instant they will silently grow as if from under the ground, twist, and there is no one to open fire on them from behind. I put an anti-tank grenade in my left hand to pull the pin with my right hand. I would not be taken alive in any case but the pointlessness of such reconnaissance was depressing. The most important thing was that there would be no one to return to the regiment with a report and the combat task would not be accomplished. Stop, Mansur. What if your intuition fails you and only one of these roads leads to Ilarionovna? Then Majorov's decision to split up was right. I tried with all my might to comprehend our possible doom. My dodgy mind whispered, be ready for death, but try not to fail in this situation. I lay down on the ground and estimated how far ahead my eye covers in this position. 200 metres. The snow-covered step ahead is empty. And there were no suspicious sounds. The earth is a good conductor of sounds. So I began to advance. Every 200 metres I put my ear to the ground, listen, get up, go, lie down again. And suddenly... My throat even spasmed. Happiness has smiled on you, Mansour. To be the first to spot the enemy is to win a life. I hear horses' hooves stamping. I crawled away, rifle and grenades at the ready, waiting. Two men are riding on horseback. The horses are not cavalry, but heavy horses, and that puzzled me. The riders in ear flaps are not fascists. They ride slowly, talking quietly. What if they're policemen? Worse, if they're polisi, it's harder to figure out. I don't notice any weapons on them. They're approaching me. I give a command. Stop. Hands up. They held their horses at once and raised their hands. Who are they? Where are you from? Where are you going? The riders are silent, looking suspiciously in my direction. I approach them with my rifle. Then, seeing the Red Army uniform, they began to tell me that they themselves were from Ilarionov, that the Germans were building a strong defence in Ilarionovna. Having searched them and made sure of their sincerity, I sent them back to the regiment with a report and returned to the fork to wait for Majorov. 
I did not wait for Majorov either in twenty minutes or in another twenty. We stormed Ilarionovka for almost five days, and, only having knocked out of it Hitlerites, at the headquarters dugouts we found the mutilated corpse of Mayorov. He was lying face down. On his head a capless helmet, on his overcoat only a trace of a belt. He had a very wide belt of the Romanian sample, on his feet boots with winding. The captured fascists testified that Majorov did not say a single word during interrogations and was shot in the morning. We buried him on the outskirts of the liberated village, on a hillock. Mayorov was from the Oral region. I realised that I was not to blame for his death, but doubts tormented me. Could I have prevented the misfortune? Maybe I should not have taken offence at the accusation of cowardice. Perhaps I should have been more persistent in proving my point to him. After all, those two roads from the fork really both led to Ilarionovna. Or maybe I should have disobeyed his order and still followed him for cover. It's too late to think now. A lot of my fighting friends died before and after this incident, but the death of Majorov does not give me peace until now. After Ilarionovka, already in the evening, a soldier named Nikolai was wounded in our company. A special case connected us with him. It was when, having left the carriages with relief after the bombing of our train on the way to the front, we made a footmarch from Filonova station to the Don. All the days of the crossing we did not eat bread, because our intendants got lost and could not find us. We were so exhausted that I was already sure that I would soon die not from a Nazi bullet, but from starvation. We were weakened both physically and morally. There was no strength even to speak, to be angry with the intendant service. After all, tomorrow we have to go to the right bank, to our first front line. I'm dizzy. If it were summer, I'd eat some herbs or roots. I'd find some... Even though it's a step, not a tiger. In the tiger there are plenty of berries, pine cones, with fat, nourishing nuts. I even liked the young needles of larch trees, sour. Or break off a shoot from a young pine tree and chew it. As a child my brain worked day and night, thinking about one thing, to eat something and satisfy my hunger a little. The miner's ration of food, cereals, sugar, salt, oil, meat, which in other families was eaten in five days, my father divided, and this he called iron order, into thirty equal parts, so meagre that they were barely enough to maintain strength for further searches for food. Near our Dugout, as well as us, livid old grandparents. They were strangers to us, but looked after us while our father and mother were at work. Our grandmother was our main interest. She brought me and my brother two empty jars every day into which we ponded. Baby urine, grandmother, as she said, treated herself and treated grandfather, and for our labour rewarded us with a piece of sugar. And all the time she kept saying, warning us, don't add water, bitches. Your father is honest. Don't dishonour your father. I was firmly convinced in my childhood that no one anywhere ever eats enough bread. That there was always very little bread, not like Ramson or Sorrel. When I grew up a little, my father started to take me to the tiger. I liked birch sap best of all. Sweet as sugar. But where does bread or flour grow? I asked my father. I'll show you, I'll show you. Just wait. We'll come out of the tiger and I'll show you how bread grows, he answered me and chuckled slyly. Doesn't bread grow in the tiger? I asked him with surprise. Everything grows in the tiger, but where can bread grow? I thought agonisingly. We came out of the tiger by the end of the day to a yellow field with no end and no edge. Here it is, bread. Look, my son. I search with my eyes, but except for the tall yellow grass, I see nothing. My father walked over to the yellow grass, tore off the tops, rubbed them between his palms, blew away the debris. I saw the tiny little grains. Father threw them into his mouth and chewed them, squinting. He gave them to me. I chewed and recognised the familiar taste of raw dough. This is grain. It is ground in the mill and made into flour. And from the flour, mom bakes bread, my father explained to me. 
What a huge field, and why is there not enough bread? I didn't understand. I would like to suck a crust. Here, on the Don land, bread is called not wheat, but more affectionately, Pashanichka. Our petty officer appeared unexpectedly, though he was glad that he found us, but he was also quite cowardly. He had starved the company for a week. I was used to seeing him with a red and fat face, but now he was just like us, emaciated. I was even afraid that he had come without bread and could hardly move his legs from hunger. But our horses, harnessed to a huge two-horse cart, were well fed with split withers. The two-horse cart was heavily laden. The foreman walked between us, lying in a layer, and persuaded us to get bread, sugar, macorka. The smell of rye bread came from both the petty officer and the two-horse. We moved. There's no strength to scold the petty officer yet. We must first come to life. We'll eat, and then the petty officer will have no mercy from us. We'll skin him. We had to share a loaf per brother. The foreman hastened to explain that he was feeding the horses with bread. We didn't argue, the horses were so well fed. Would they have survived without bread? They would have fallen down themselves and wouldn't have carried our bread. The petty officer was good, though. He cut off a slice from his loaf and advised us to eat no more than a hundred grams at the first meal. Otherwise, the stomach will be cut off, scolotti will start, God forbid. Don't be greedy, the foreman instructs us in a shorthand manner. He'll cut your belly. Better yet, suck a little, like candy, skip a little bit. Suvorov Pavel Georgievich noticed approvingly. The petty officer advises us correctly, he knows his business. In the damp, the beginning of November, the air was filled with the tart aroma of rye bread. We breathed bread, we absorbed bread with our stomachs, we came alive. We began to laugh at ourselves, that we were almost dying. We laughed at the petty officer, how he was a bit cowardly when he saw us lying in layers. We laughed at the fact that the petty officer also came up. I couldn't look at the bread, said the petty officer, happy that his conscience was clear. I'll be fed up and the company starved to death. In short, everything was going well and we had a real holiday. But an emergency happened. My loaf disappeared from my bag. I reached out to cut another slice. I couldn't believe it. The whole company became agitated and started talking. The battalion commander came to the noise. At that time, we still had Gridasov Fyodor Vasilyevich as a commander. A small captain, shaved head, red face, like after a bath, the order of the red banner on his chest. Gridasov was out on wounding, but then came back to us after treatment in the hospital. He asks, what's the matter? We tell him, and we're not happy ourselves. Shoot the scoundrel on the spot, orders the commander and himself, unbuttoning his holster, takes out a nagant. The company, as one, grabbed the bags. Here already the contents of all the bags sprinkled on the cloak tents. Only one is tightly tied, and the owner is in no hurry to untie it. Doomed, he lowers his head lower, and lower in the crosshairs of our gazes. Startled by a soft click with which the commander cocked the trigger. Examine. Combat nodded to someone on the bag. I did it so quickly that no one at first did not understand. I was afraid that the combat would not understand me either. Almost pushing away the one who had already bent over the bag, I jumped up to Nikolai, that was the name of the thief, ran my hand into his bag and, having found two loaves, froze. Everyone waited in silent suspense. I stood up, straightened at attention and reported, Stolen bread is not detected. For a moment the commander's face held an expression of surprised bewilderment, but immediately his eyes said to me, Well done. And he put the nagan back in its holster. Without saying anything more, the combat disappeared in the direction of the battalion CP. The whole company breathed a sigh of relief. Without asking any more questions, where is the missing loaf? Each cut off a slice from his own and put it on my cloak tent. A. Nicholas covered his face with his palms, lay down on the ground next to the ill-fated sack and lay like that, probably for two hours. A man, sentenced to a shameful death, and received a pardon. 
and in two or three weeks this Nikolai was seriously wounded by a shrapnel in his lungs. There was a wound in his chest through which air was coming in and out with a whoosh. It happened after Ilarionovka, in the evening. There were no Zanitars in our battalion. The wounded after Fivoya were carried out by ourselves and brought to the sanitary company, which was always in the rear of the regiment but far away. There were no more than ten or twelve of us in the company. Replenishment had not arrived for two or three days, and it so happened that I was ordered to drag my godson to the Sanrota. As it happened, we were again without food for twenty-four hours. The company was waiting impatiently for the kitchen when I received the order to take the wounded man to the rear. I jumped into a strap of wire, dragged myself and the drag in the rapidly thickening dusk and pondered, had the kitchen arrived without me, or would I be able to return in time? The wounded man is unconscious. I could be sure that he was alive only when I stopped. The skis under the drag scraped nastily on the snow mixed with earth. Once again I pause. The air is still whistling in the wounded man's chest, so he is alive. And again I force myself to move, to go around the funnels, trenches. Twilight is no longer dusk, it's night. I don't want to get lost, and I'll be offended if the wounded man dies when I bring him to the place. Suddenly, or so I thought, I hear it. Mansur. I stopped and bent down. Mansur, shoot him. If you can't, stop it. I've tormented you. Where did I get the strength from? I pulled myself into the strap and ran without stopping, as if running away from my shameful mean thoughts. I hoped that Nikolai would die at the beginning of the journey and I would be free of the load in time for the distribution of hot food. And why so mixed good and evil in one man? In me? Perhaps I was scary in the dark, teeth gritted, breathing hoarsely and wildly bulging eyes, alive or dead as soon as possible to bring Nikolai to the San Rota. To say that I saved his life for the second time out of special friendship to him, I cannot. And the first time it was more superstition. It was my loaf. And now I was in a hurry to clear my conscience, to defeat in myself the beginnings of that evil, despicable, which I hate so much and which is also in me. I almost fell into a deep gully, packed with rear units. From the gully rose a hearty and delicious smell of food, mixed with the odours of horse manure, gasoline, hay. Somewhere in the dugouts, small windows were shining. I went into one dugout, and in a hoarse, cold voice I asked to receive a seriously wounded man. What regiment? asks the big-haired orderly. One thousand thirty-fourth, I answered. Take him further. Here is one thousand twenty-sixth. The heavy door closed tightly, and all at once I ran out of strength to pull the dragger further. Nikolai is moaning and delirious. I'm dragging it. What can I do? He's a bureaucrat. I should put a bullet in his narrow forehead. But then you can't prove to the tribunal that you were right, and you'll get the same bullet. Another dugout. I knock on the door. The dugouts were built by the Nazis, and everything is done thoroughly. The door opens, together with a cloud of tasty steam, an orderly comes out. I ask him a question. Which Santrot? Thousand and thirty-sixth, he answers. So it's ours, I tell him confidently. Take the seriously wounded man. Without looking back, I ducked into the dugout and sat down at the table like a master. The orderlies brought Nikolai in, he's already on a stretcher. Give me something to eat, I ask. They put wheat porridge on the table, warm, fragrant, fat. I'm full, I fell asleep at the table. They woke me up when it was still dark, with the understanding that I could get to the front line in the dark. I finished the delicious porridge. They also gave me half a loaf of bread. I hear, Mansur, come here. I went to the far corner of the dugout. My Nikolai is alive. Mansur, I'll never forget you. God grant you to come home. I dragged the thief, pardoned by me, up to half of the way. Then, after his request to shoot him, to leave him. I ran away from my own mean thoughts, and in the Santrot I said goodbye to a real battle friend, 
wishing him to survive from the bottom of my heart, not a step back. That day, November 23rd, 1942, when the troops of our southwestern front set themselves the task of joining the troops advancing towards us from the south, I remember episodes of continuous unceasing battle. Loaded, as always, with carriages, trunks, plates, we were running to change our firing position, pushing the fiercely stubborn Germans. Again our mortars fall. A very good strong man from Bodaibo died. A Siberian. A gold digger and prospector. Akin to me. I too come from the Miasoloto mines. I have the heavy duty of the company's party commander to take the party card from the dead man. I returned to the Siberian, quickly freed his body from the bag, and could not understand what kind of weight, it did not look like mortar parts, crushed the back of the Siberian's head. I unwrap it, a hand sewing machine carefully wrapped in a cloak tent. I felt bad. What did he die for? The Siberian was an excellent, brave, enduring and enduring warrior, and in peacetime he was a good family man and a caring host. For him, a sewing machine was a symbol of prosperity. He wanted to bring the machine back from the war and give it to his wife. I remembered my life before the war. We had one or two sewing machines for the whole mine. A gramophone, a bicycle were very rare. But it was this machine that killed the Siberian. I didn't find a single scratch on his body, he just tripped and fell. I didn't tell anyone in the company about this machine so that they wouldn't condemn the man. Maybe it was for nothing. It would have been a good lesson. In the strip of our 293rd Infantry Division, the 69th Tank Brigade was operating. The tankers had a hard time. After the disgrace of Kalash, the Germans had tightened the anti-tank defence, and our tanks were now and then burst into flames from thermite shells. The tank, which the company followed in the attack, caught fire. It seemed to me that the very armour in it was on fire, as if it were not steel, but wooden. The tanker jumped out, engulfed in flames from heel to head. Save the colonel! He fell on the snow, rolling around to knock down the flames, and he shouted, Brothers, save the colonel! Everyone is trying to bypass the burning tank. It is about to explode. I want to pass by. I'm not in a hurry for pancakes. I'm in an attack. And those who have already run here, my cunning brain tells me in justification, had more time to spare. The tank explodes in two or three minutes after it catches fire. But my conscience, I hear, screams at me. Don't waste time. Get on the tank. Brain. It's useless. You won't make it anyway. And my conscience. Of course, all this war in me is a fraction of a second. Still, my brakes worked. I can already feel the hot armour sizzling under my wet gloves. The armour is slippery. I can't jump and I can't see any brackets or protrusions. But I can't stop and jump as far as I can. And from the hatch above, hot smoke puffed in my face and my hands, the living hands of a living tanker, clutched with a dead grip on the sleeves of my overcoat. I put my hands deeper into the sleeves of my overcoat so that I could pull it out of the cramped hatch, squeezed my eyes shut, turned my face away. The burning smoke was corroding my eyes and pulled it out with jerks. We fell down with him on the nice earth. The ground is nice, but we don't have to lie on it yet. The colonel's both legs were broken. I grabbed him and dragged him through the snow away from the tank. Twenty metres. Thirty metres. The explosion was strong. The turret rose five metres, tumbled in the air and crashed next to the hull. Iron from the sky. The colonel hugged me. Son, I won't forget. What's your last name? Abdulin. I won't forget. For now, take this gun as a souvenir. When the medics arrived, they put him on a drag made of skis and dragged him to the rear. Three decades later, Marshal of Armoured Forces Oleg Alexandrovich Losik, who in those days fought in the 4th Mech Corps in the combat zone of the 293rd Infantry Division, will help me to establish the identity of the Colonel. He was the Battalion Commissar of the 69th Tank Brigade G. V. Provolov. We fought not for awards, it's true. 
I'll tell you in good faith. When I was climbing on the armour of the burning tank, I didn't think about the award. I thought, just to make it before the explosion. But comrades, and now in the village of Pestrovka of Sterli Tamaksky, district of Bashkir ASSR, lives my fellow soldier Ivan Alexandrovich Evstignev, who saw and remembers this episode. Comrades congratulated me in advance with the award for the saved. Until the 75th year, I still had hope to learn about his fate. I wrote to the newspaper Pravda, but then I finally found out. In the 69th Tank Brigade, Colonel G. V. Provanov is considered burned in the tank, and he was posthumously awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. He commanded the brigade in that battle to replace the sick brigadier. I suppose the tankers, having hastily examined the exploded and burnt tank after the battle, came to the conclusion that the battalion commissar was burnt. But what really happened to him? After I parted with him and elderly orderlies on a drag made of skis, dragged him in the direction of the sanitary unit, hit by shelling, died from shrapnel, escaping death in a burning tank, died of blood loss. In such a case, there must have been some identification documents with him. I was unlucky, as they say, but I was only unlucky with my reward. That man, if he did die, having just clung to life in such a marvellous way, he was unlucky more. When one speaks of the missing in action in the war, I think of that very day. The ground was literally standing up, and surely more than one person was covered with it once and for all, along with all his identification documents. Two more monstrous images came into my memory when, having said goodbye to the tank colonel, I was catching up with my own. A strange figure on three points, on elbows and one knee, shuddering in convulsions, flew away from the front towards me. The second leg in the felt boots is unnaturally long, dangling lifelessly. It clings to all sorts of irregularities, and the whole body shudders from these clutches. I was already rushing past. A man's leg had been torn off, the medics would pick him up, carry him to the rear, and he would be alive. Suddenly, howling terribly, I froze. Froze on the spot, not because of this howling. The soldier sat down, took out a penknife from his pocket, pulled closer the Valinok with his leg, and, trying the blade with his finger, blunt, grinning wildly, began to cut the exposed tendon, on which, in fact, the leg was still held. I always had a good knife with me. Need a hand? To tell you the truth, I think about it now. And then I watched without a single thought in a dazed brain, as the soldier, furiously grinning, cut off his leg. At last, the leg fell beside him. The soldier took off his cap here, put it on the stump and carefully tied it with his trouser belt. Then he lifted his foot in a felt boot, pressed it to his chest like a child, and began to bury it with earth mixed with dirty snow. Nurse Lutsenko Masha came to him, and I forced myself to move from my seat and run, stumbling further. Artillery attack! I barely had time to jump into the first trench to wait it out. Another infantry soldier jumps after me. He jumps down and screams in a frenzy. Give me a cigarette! I take out a kit set, shaking off the lumps sprinkled on us from above. I hold out, and he horse mate. Wrap it up! And while I, sluggishly comprehending the tone of his request, wrapping up the goat's leg, he hurries, yelling to me through the rumble, My hands are torn off! I look, and the truth, the sleeves of his overcoat dangling and blistered with blood. I put a goat's leg in his lips, and holding out the light of a lighter, I notice their chemical ink colour. The artillery attack stopped suddenly. The soldier, as if on springs, jumped out of the trench and ran, shouting goodbye. I fought back, brother. In the company I was already considered dead. They saw that I climbed on the burning tank, which two minutes later exploded. Many looked back at that explosion and noted in their minds, Abdulin was killed. Alive! They shouted when they saw me. How sweet it is in the war to feel someone's unpretended joy at the fact that you are still alive. Suvorov, my dear commander, even had tears in his eyes when he embraced me. Well, Mansur, you're not to be missed, he said not only sternly, not only proudly. Finally, in the afternoon of the day, 
the southwestern front troops joined the troops that were advancing towards us from the south. In the heat of the moment, not realizing that the fascists were no longer between us, we rubbed each other with a light, each other. Then it seemed to me, as well as to many, that I noticed something wrong at once. Mines were flying towards us without howling, explosions were smokeless, and machine gun and machine gun fire differed in that there were no bursting bullets. Dense fire pinned us to the ground. We see a mass of men counter-attacking us. It is strange for us to see that their figures do not look like Hitler's. Somebody saw that the mass of manpower counter-attacking us is their own. The reaction was lightning fast, though delayed. Suddenly the battle was over. Everyone stopped firing. We ran towards each other, and only the squeak of snow under our feet. Such silence. Brothers! My relatives! How can it be, eh? Our own men beat their own men in the heat of the moment. We hugged and cried, because there were killed and wounded. Everyone blamed himself for not shouting, for not taking the responsibility to shout, our own, when he felt something wrong. After all, in such cases the soldier's invisible telegraph works lightning fast. Everyone would have stopped firing in a flash. Then we tidied up the battlefield and couldn't look each other in the eye. We are now fighting on the Don front. The historic moment in the Battle of Stalingrad has come. The ring has closed and 330,000 Hitler's army is completely surrounded. Our task now is not to let it escape from the cauldron. Suvorov was worried sick about me. So many things happened to me in three weeks of the war, and the news of my death, and then that I was alive. Brought us closer together. When it queeted down a little, he and I talked frankly about many things, and in particular about the meaning of the order, number 227. Not a step back. Here the psychology of soldiers is very complex, and to the depth of the truth, never to get to the bottom of no one. In our and Suvorov's mind, we could retreat until this order appeared. It worked as a relief from uncertainty, and we stopped. We all stopped together. A soldier stopped, convinced that his neighbour stopped as well. We stood to the death all together, knowing that no one would rush to escape. The order turned out to be a strong weapon of the soldiers, psychological. Although it was awkward to realise the fact that behind me there is a barrier detachment. Suvorov, who fought from the first days of the war and retreated with the regiment from the western border, from Brest, sighed meaningfully in conversation with me. We should have issued such an order earlier. A trench is a firing position. We realised that the Nazis, being in the cauldron, will not want to sit passively. How many of them are there? Nobody knows the exact number. We persistently ask our superiors, how many krauts are in the cauldron? 1,040. They answer us. Wow. 40,000. The figure was impressive. And if half of them go west on a narrow section through us, through our regiment? We found out the truth only two months later, on February 2nd, 1943. It turns out that there were 330,000 Germans in the cauldron. Why did you deceive us? We later asked our commanders. And they, slyly grinning, answered that sometimes in war you cannot tell the real truth. And this cunning is called a holy lie. They said 40,000, so as not to frighten the soldiers. That's right, we agreed. In the meantime, at the end of November 1942, we were tasked to immediately prepare to repel a possible attempt of the surrounded troops to break through the ring. The work boiled over. We dug trenches in full profile. To do this, it is necessary to hollow out a one and a half metre layer of frozen, almost petrified soil. Then dig a hole in the bottom of the trench. Each such burrow is not similar to the other in shape and volume because it is dug according to its own taste and size. Two or three people also made a bed. It was warmer together. The layer of permafrost above our heads successfully replaced a concrete shelter. When we went to sleep, we always stuck our legs out in case of a sudden explosion so that we could get out if we were covered with earth. And at night, the mortars kept the enemy at bay. 
In the daytime, we would shoot the gully where the fascists were hobnobbing on all their economic affairs. We would write down on the firing chart the data of accurate shooting of all the twists and branches of their positions, and then methodically, at intervals of five minutes, we would fire. It was called wearing down the enemy. The fascists have no rest from us all night long, and we manage to sleep. Each calculation takes turns firing for an hour. You let out your hundred mines in the direction of enemy positions and hurry to the hole, where comrades, huddled together, have already accumulated warmth. Before that, I didn't pay attention, but during the war, I noticed that my knees were the most vulnerable to cold. Maybe, because on the knees of a man, there is nothing keeping heat, skin and bones. And that's where the overcoat saved the soldier. Overcoat's floors are long. In a campaign, or in an attack, of course, it was a disadvantage. They got tangled in the legs and had to be tucked under the belt so that they did not interfere with running. But during sleep, the disadvantage turned into a plus. It was very convenient to wrap the cold feet with the overcoat. You can't think of more successful clothes for a soldier, and the material chosen for it is suitable. Overcoat cloth. Not only warms well, and snow does not stick to it, and dried clay is easily removed. The rain also rolls off it. It dries quickly. The suit was harder to clean off. We had lamps too. You could pour diesel oil into a casing from a magpie, cut off a piece of floor from the same overcoat, and that was the wick. The soot was flakes, but you could sew on a button or write a letter. When you crawl into such a hole, you don't want to die. How, you think, cosy, how nice it is. A trench is a soldier's workplace, a firing position, but it's also his home. I remember and never tire of admiring the will of a man to live. It would seem that the trench is ready and the hole is dug, climb into it and have time to get some sleep before the command to fight is sounded. But no, a man's passion for beautification has already flared up. He begins to hollow out one niche for grenades, another for ammunition, and a third for a machine gun, so that it would be at hand and there in the kettle wants to determine the place. The soldier has already settled in his foxhole, and now he treasures it. The command, put the mortars on the packs, forward, sometimes resonated in the soul with the instant pain of parting with a settled piece of land, and to give up one's trench to the enemy was like death. For some reason the fascists were too lazy to dig trenches for themselves. Either they did not expect to stay long in the cauldron, or our frozen ground near Stalingrad was not to their teeth. I don't know, but it happened that they built their firing positions out of frozen corpses. They would lay a wall of corpses around themselves in two or three layers, cover it with snow and the shelter was ready. The stiffened corpses of dead Hitlerites protected the living from bullets and splinters. But I did not envy the Germans when sudden thaws came. And our regimental 76mm guns easily destroyed such engineering constructions. The captured Germans, with their arms around their heads and swaying, often muttered, Oh, mein Goth! Understandable. Oh, my God! But what does Gott mit uns mean? Such an inscription was on the plaques of Hitler's soldiers' belts. The belts are strong, made of real leather. And you would take off, you think, the belt from the killed Nazi, and gird yourself with a good belt, but the inscription on the brass plaque, embossed, clear, as on a tombstone, stops you. I must first find out what it means in Russian. Or you'll put on yourself something you don't know. Got is clear. God. But the other two words? That's when I regretted that I was too lazy to study German at school. I searched a dozen of our trenches and trenches until finally I found one soldier, a former rural school teacher, who, having sweated a lot, translated the mysterious phrase. That's it, it turns out. God is with us. On the corpses from the thawed engineering structures of the Nazis, this inscription was now perceived as a particularly caustic mockery of them. And ordinary German soldiers did not know that they were in the cauldron. From the testimonies of the prisoners, it became clear that the fascist command was hiding the terrible truth from the rank and file in every possible way, in order not to deprive the soldiers of hope for victory, 
and to make them fight with us to the end. I myself saw a German prisoner who was concussed and as a wounded man persistently said, Ich gehe nach Moscow. I'm going to Moscow. The other day I saw anti-tank dogs for the first time. I, as a tiger man, like dogs very much, and when I learned about suicide dogs, I was very upset. What does this have to do with an unrequited animal, the joy of childhood? A dog is a loyal friend. A dog trusts a man, and a man deceives him into sending him to his death under a tank. My legs are shaking, but they carry me to the dogs. They are here, next to each other, with their dog soldiers, waiting for their hour. Colorful, shaggy, ears hanging down and sticking out. And this one, one ear is standing and the other one is hanging down. He was a naughty boy, I guess. Next to it, a bale of explosives with eight kilograms of explosives. He looks at me, tilting his head to the left and to the right, hoping for a treat. The dog breeder turned out to be a middle-aged red-haired man from the Krasnoyarsk region, a fellow countryman of mine. We got to talking. The dogs were trained for three months. They were fed only under a moving tank. That's the whole secret of heroism of anti-tank dogs. There is an antenna sticking out of the bale, connected to the fuse. I, in order not to distract the dog, went to my home and told Suvorov about everything. Soon tanks appeared from the German side, and we saw a black shaggy ball rushing towards them. After him, with a small interval, the second, the third, the first dog destroyed the tank with a powerful explosion, then came the second explosion, the third. The fascist tankers began to turn their vehicles abruptly and disappeared at top speed. There is no escape from anti-tank dogs. From our trenches shouted, Hurrah! and I should be happy too. The German attack was thwarted, but I cried, cursing both the war and the subhumans who started it. At night, fascist transport airplanes threw military cargoes into the cauldron in solid echelons. Shooting trophy rocket launchers, we confused fascist navigators, and parcels fell from above. Bread loaves, ersatz, sausage, stew, woolen socks, straw boots, cigarettes, galettes and the like. Bread, in cellophane casings, baked, as they say, in 1933. But the soldiers rejected the German bread. Our breadcrumbs are tastier than our breadcrumbs in the whole world. We got more food and all sorts of junk from German transport planes than the fascists themselves. Their pilots performed their combat missions dishonestly and inaccurately. They cowardly dropped cargo wherever they could and quickly returned to their bases.